I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone looks out for his own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you, and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, and you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Thank you, Craig. I love my job. There's no greater work in the world than the work of the gospel. And uh, the work of the gospel, I mean, the gospel is good news. The work of the gospel is God's plan to redeem and restore his creation. God created all things to be very good, and they were very good. At the very beginning, they were, he says it was very good until mankind sinned and rebelled against God. Our sin separated us from God. Our sin causes all the problems that we see in all the world around us. But God had a plan. He had a good news plan to redeem his creation. Jesus paid the full price for our salvation. He paid the full price for our sin. He paid the full price for the redemption of all creation. When Jesus went to the cross, when he shed his blood, just before he died, he said, it is finished. And in a sense, that is the work that was completed for the redemption of all creation. The gospel is the good news that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead, giving us the opportunity to have eternal life. However, there's more to God's overall plan of redemption than just the work Jesus did for us at the cross. You see, God certainly could have done all the work himself. He doesn't need our help. He could have done every single aspect of his plan of redemption completely by himself. But God is a relational God. He enjoys working together with us, and he invites us to join with him in the greatest work of all, the work of the gospel. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, this great work, the greatest work of all, the work of the gospel. The work of the gospel is, is not just telling people about Jesus, although that certainly is an absolutely essential aspect. We must tell people about Jesus. But it's even more than that. The work of the gospel is also living out the message of the gospel in our lives, demonstrating the pattern and, and the message of the gospel in the way that we live. Philippians 1.27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. 
we're told to conduct ourselves, to live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel. And then in the very next chapter, at the beginning of chapter 2, Paul tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition, but to consider others as more important than ourselves. And then we're encouraged to look at Jesus, the greatest example of gospel living, of this gospel attitude. And we're told to have his attitude, the attitude he had, the attitude of unselfish, sacrificial love when he went to the cross. Even though Jesus was equal to God, he humbled himself. He became a man. Even though he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he humbled himself and became a servant, even a slave. Jesus was willing to suffer and die for our sins. He thought of us before himself. He willingly took this journey down into humility, down into serving, down into suffering, and even to the point of death on the cross because of his great love for us. And this is the attitude this is the, the, the mindset of Jesus that we are called to imitate, that we are called to live out and demonstrate. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is that mindset, that attitude that we are to imitate in the way that we live. This is the pattern of the gospel. A few months back, I showed you a diagram called the J-curve, and it was a a simple diagram one of my professors, uh, Paul Miller, came up with to show the pattern of gospel living, the pattern of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's the shape of the letter J. In the original J-curve, Jesus went down the J-curve into humility, into service, into suffering. He became a man. He, he left all his glory and splendor in heaven. And he even went into suffering and death on the cross. He came to the bottom of the J-curve in dying for our sins. But then God raised him up on the third day, and he came up the other side of the J-curve into glory, into power, into splendor. And God raised him up and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, all would bow and all would confess him as Lord. That's the pattern of the Jacob. That's the pattern of the gospel. And it's a map for us to follow in the way that we live. Was that me? Am I still on? Okay. I don't know what that was. We'll find out later. There are several ways that this pattern, this J-curve living, living out the gospel, can be seen in our lives. One of them is in, in baptism. And, and we see this throughout Scripture, the, the phrases and terms that are connected with the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection, uh, taking up your cross, uh, dying to sin. Living a new life. These are all phrases that describe what Jesus did at the cross, but they're also phrases that describe the Christian life. And we see in baptism that, that when we're with Christ in baptism, we're giving people a picture of the gospel. We're going down the J-curve into the water, buried with Christ in baptism, putting to death our old life, and then being raised up into a new life where the Holy Spirit lives within us and helps us to grow in Christ. And we walk in newness of life. Another way we demonstrate the gospel is when we repent of our sins. Again, we're going down the J-curve. We're saying no to ourselves, our own sinful desires. We're putting to death our sinful passions, our, our sinful deeds. We crucify our sinful desires. And then we come up the other side of the J-curve through the power of the Holy Spirit. He helps us to live a transformed life. He helps us to become more like Christ and develop in those character traits of the fruit of the Spirit. Another way 
that we demonstrate the pattern of the gospel, the message of the gospel, is in our love and service for one another. 1 John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You see the pattern of the gospel there in love, in serving, in sacrificing ourselves for the sake of others. This is the J-curve that we see here in Philippians chapter 2. It is a love J-curve. It is the message of the gospel when we humble ourselves and consider others more important than ourselves. It's the message of the gospel when we sacrifice uh, ourselves, our wants, our desires for the sake of others. When we're even willing to suffer in order to serve others. And sometimes those sacrifices feel like we're giving up too much. We're we're giving up our life. It's like we're dying. But God uses that. He uses that whole process to transform us into the image of Christ. And we start to develop the very same love for one another that Christ shows to us. And we become more like Christ. Timothy and Epaphroditus are excellent examples of living out the gospel of showing people what the gospel looks like in real life. And that's what Paul talks about here in Philippians 2, 19 through 30. He, he tells the Philippians about his plans to send Timothy and Epaphroditus to them. But this, this passage is not just an itinerary. It, it's not just a, a, a lifeless, cold uh, travel arrangement plan that he needs them to know about. There's a message here, and it's a gospel message. He is giving them examples of what it looks like to live lives that are worthy of the gospel. The work of the gospel is not just telling people about Jesus. It's also showing people Jesus, living out His selfless, sacrificial love in our service for one another. Let's take a look at Timothy and Epaphroditus, and, and see how their lives are demonstrations of the work of the gospel. Let's first look at Timothy. How did Timothy share in the work of the gospel? Well, first of all, we see he had a sincere concern for others. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. See, Timothy was not a fake. He was the real deal. He was authentic. He was genuine. He was there when Paul first started the church at Philippi. He knew these people. He was invested in them. He spent time with them. And he was sincerely, genuinely concerned about the church there at Philippi. How do we know when people are genuinely concerned about us. I mean, do you know people in your life who absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt, they have genuine concern for you. They're authentic. Usually we can tell by how much they're willing to invest in us. Are they willing to spend time with us? Are they willing to listen to us? Are they willing to sit down and interact with us? How much do they invest of their lives into us? That tells us that they are genuinely concerned about us. And that's also a good way for us to evaluate our concern for others. We can ask ourselves the same question. How much am I willing to invest in this relationship, in this person? How much time, money, and energy am I willing to sacrifice for the sake of others? And in our evaluations, what do we do when we find that our concern is less than genuine? What if when we evaluate our motives, we see that we're really concerned more about our own interests? What am I getting out of this than a, a true, genuine, authentic concern for others? What do we do when we come up short? in the genuine concern. That's when we need to go back to the gospel. That's when we need to look at what Jesus invested in us. Think about it. What did Jesus invest in you? How much was he willing to give 
for the sake of his relationship with you. He gave it all. He went to the cross for us. And in those times when we are doubting our concern for others, when we're concerned about whether or not we're really doing ministry and serving others for ourselves or truly for others, allow the message of the gospel to wash over your soul and really meditate on what Christ was willing to invest in you. And ask the Holy Spirit to give you that same heart, that same genuine concern that Jesus has for us. Timothy had that kind of concern. He also shared in the work of the gospel by putting Christ before himself. Paul said, for everyone's own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. He was saying this in contrast to the person uh, of Timothy, this, this partner in ministry that he had. Paul needed a strong young man to go on a short-term mission trip. And this would be a dangerous mission trip. This would be an 800-mile trip and they were, that they would encounter. And he needed someone who was committed to the work of the gospel. And he was having a hard, find, hard time finding someone who would be able to do this. But he thought, no, Timothy, that's my man. Because he has a genuine interest in the people there at Philippi, and he is dedicated 100% to the work of the gospel. Like Paul, Timothy was ready to make sacrifices. He was ready to give up his own personal desires for the work of the gospel. You know, our natural tendency is to put ourselves at the top of our own priority list. To make our own interest the most important thing for us to watch out for. It's, it, that's natural. That's what we do by nature. But you know, that's not what Jesus demonstrated for us when he went to the cross. He demonstrated just the opposite. He put his own natural desires aside. When he was in the garden, he expressed what his own natural human desire was to avoid pain, to avoid suffering, to avoid death. But then he prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. The gospel is a picture of self-denial. It's a picture of sacrifice. It's a picture of serving others. It's a picture of submission to God and putting our own personal interests at the bottom of the list. And Christianity is that same picture. Christianity is not about doing what we want. Christianity is not about putting our own personal interests at the top of our priority list. Christianity is about self-denial. It's about sacrifice, it's about serving, and it's about submission to Jesus as our Lord. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his what? His cross. Even before Jesus went to the cross, he was giving a, a, giving a picture of what it meant to live out the gospel and saying, this is what following me is about, taking up your cross. It's about self-denial. He says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. Timothy put Jesus first in his life, even above his own personal interests, and he was demonstrating the message of the gospel. How did, how did Timothy share in the work of the gospel? Well, he served Christ together with others. Paul said, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. Remember, God is a relational God. And this, this gospel message, this gospel work is the greatest work in the world. He is perfect. God is perfect. He's all-powerful. He could have done all this work. He could have done everything that's in his plan of redemption completely by, our, by himself. He didn't need our help to do any of it but he's a relational God. He enjoys working with us. Just like a good father enjoys working together with his children, God enjoys working together with us, and he invites us to join with him in this great work, the work of the gospel. God also enjoys seeing his children work together in unity. Just like any good father, being able to work together without fighting, God loves to see us working together in this great work, the work of the gospel. And that's the kind of relationship that Paul and Timothy had. 
Paul and Timothy loved working with each other. They loved working together for the sake of the gospel. Paul converted Timothy. Uh, Timothy was, was like a son to Paul. Paul was like a father to Timothy. And they'd been working together for over 10 years at this writing, and they would continue working for another seven years until Paul would be executed. Timothy was converted, and he, he was there when Paul planted the church at Philippi. And they loved serving together in the work of the gospel. And, and by the way, the word for served here in verse 22, the Greek word, means to serve as a slave. You may remember last week I told you that there's two different words for a servant. One's diakonos. That's where we get our word deacon. It's a, a very general word. just means someone who serves. But then there's doulos, and that means a slave. And this is the word for slave. He, he served as a slave. And Paul, when he first started this letter, back in chapter 1, verse 1, he introduces himself and Timothy as slaves of Christ Jesus. The very first words we read in the book are Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. And he doesn't give himself any other titles writes a book, he, he says something about how he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. He has some authority, but not in this letter. In this letter, he just says, yeah, me and Timothy, slaves of Jesus. Why is that? Well, you see, Philippi was a Roman colony. Citizen of that city was also a citizen of Rome, and citizenship in the Roman Empire was important. That was, that was exalted status. And no slave can be a citizen. If you're a slave, you're not a citizen. If you're a citizen, you're not a slave. And so there at Philippi, there was this huge gap between those at the top of the social status, the social ladder, citizens of Rome, citizens of Philippi, and then those at the bottom, slaves. And Paul and Timothy both illustrate the power of the gospel, the humility of the gospel, the confidence of the gospel by introducing themselves, presenting themselves slaves of Jesus with confidence, knowing they don't need any other status, and inviting all the Christians there at Philippi to take on that same title. I don't need anything, anything else. I don't need any exalted status. I'm willing to be a slave of Jesus. That's all I need. That's all I want. They were illustrating this love curve of humility uh, and showing the same kind of humility that Jesus showed towards us. Timothy served Christ together with others. Let's take a look at Epaphroditus. Unlike Timothy, uh, we don't have very much information about Epaphroditus. He's only mentioned twice in the Bible, once here in chapter 2 of Philippians, and then one time in chapter 4 of Philippians. That's all we hear about him, just right here in this book. But Epaphroditus was a messenger from the church at Philippi. He brought a gift of financial support to Paul, who was in prison at Rome. And this was a much-needed gift. Uh, prisoners in Rome were not taken care of the Roman government. Rome did not pay for their meals or their clothes or their medical treatment. They had to figure out that by themselves. And it was difficult to earn money when you're in prison. And so Paul was very thankful for this gift that Epaphroditus brought from the church at Philippi. And the trip from Philippi to Rome was a dangerous eight-mile trek, a journey that would take three to four weeks depending on the weather. And somewhere along the way, Epaphroditus got sick. Some scholars think that this was probably malaria. Uh, at that time, it was called the Roman fever. And at that time, they didn't have all the medications and advancements in, that we have today. A lot of times people died from this kind of thing. 
One of his traveling companions went back to Philippi to let the church there know about Epaphroditus and how he was sick. But Epaphroditus was determined to deliver this money to Paul. And so he continued on in his journey. And he fought through the pain and he finally got to Rome, exhausted, dehydrated, and on the brink of death. But he survived. God healed him of his illness and he was restored. So how did Epaphroditus share in the work of the gospel? Well, first, he was a partner in the work of the gospel. Paul said, but I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. (laughs) Epaphroditus was a team player. He was a partner with Christ and with the church that was sending him for the sake of the gospel. Look at how Paul describes Epaphroditus in this verse alone. I mean, look at all these modifiers, all these descriptive phrases that Paul uses to show what kind of a person Epaphroditus was. He says, He's my brother. Okay, I, I, I've connected with this guy, he's like a brother to me. He's my fellow worker. We've we've partnered together in the work of the gospel. He's my fellow soldier. We've stood side by side in spiritual battles and fought for each other. And your messenger. By the way, the word there for messenger is apostolos, the same word for apostle. And then he says, you sent him to take care of my needs. He, He lists several things that show... The, the attributes, the character traits of Epaphroditus. But I think more important than that, the thing that he's really bringing out here is the relationship that Epaphroditus has to the church at Philippi and to Paul himself. He's my brother. He's my fellow worker. He's my fellow soldier. And he's your messenger. You sent him. And he's helped take care of us. There's a relationship here a partnership that he's emphasizing. And God designed the work of the gospel to be a team effort. We share together as partners in this great work, the greatest work of all. Back at the beginning of chapter 2, Paul exhorted the Philippians to work in a team. He says, you guys, you guys need to be like-minded. You need to be united in spirit. You need to be, have the same love. You need to have the same purpose. And later in chapter 4, he'll get more specific. He'll actually name names. He'll say, okay, Yodi and Syntyche, you two ladies, you need to work on this unity thing. You need to learn how to get along together. And the rest of you, church, you guys need to help these two women get along together. Epaphroditus was providing a good example for them to follow. And I think this may be one of the other reasons that Paul wants to send Epaphroditus back. Because he's a bridge builder. He's a team player. He's going to help the problem back at the church at Philippi. How did Epaphroditus share in the work of the gospel? He had a sincere concern for his congregation. Paul said, for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. Epaphroditus was missing his home church. He was deeply concerned for them because he knew that they knew he was sick and he didn't want them to worry about that. Incidentally, this word for distressed is the same word for the agony Jesus went through when he was praying in the garden before he was arrested. So Epaphroditus longs for all of the Philippians. Apparently, Epaphroditus had not taken sides in the Yodia Syntyche debate. He longed for all of them. He missed all of them. He was concerned about all of them in both camps, regardless of whether they were slaves or citizens, of whether they were in the Yodia camp or the Syntyche camp, regardless of whether they were Jews or Gentiles, regardless of whether they were Republicans or Democrats. That didn't matter. They were all his brothers and sisters in Christ, and he longed for all of them. Notice also that the thing he wrote out the church at Philippi is the people. I don't know what the church at Rome was like, but uh, apparently there was something that he really missed in his home church. And it, it wasn't the dynamic preaching. It wasn't the powerful music that the praise team was leading. 
It wasn't the great facilities in, in the building where they met. It wasn't all the programs. The thing that really hooked Epaphroditus to his church was the people. He was connected to the people. He had a deep concern for them. More than anything else, he was hooked full of his church. God wants us to have that same deep concern, that same uh, intimate, close connection with the people in our congregation. How do we do that? How do we develop a sincere concern for one another? Well, it goes back to the same principle we saw in Timothy. Investing in the relationships. Are we spending time with one another? Are we praying for one another? How much are we investing in the lives of others? That's what develops deep concern. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What you invest in, that becomes important to you. Are we invest? How did Epaphroditus share in the work of the gospel? He poured his life into the work of Christ. Paul said, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make for the help you could not give me. Paul said that Epaphroditus almost died for the work of Christ. And, and he doesn't tell us exactly how Epaphroditus was healed. Maybe he came back and Paul laid hands on him and he was healed instantly, miraculously. Maybe the, the church there in Rome prayed and he was healed. Maybe Dr. Luke just nursed him back to health. Dr. Luke was there. But we do know this. Epaphroditus was seriously ill. He almost died. And we know that his healing was an act of God's mercy, both on Epaphroditus and on Paul. Paul said he would have died, which was a very real possibility, even in Paul's mind. Paul says he would have had sorrow upon sorrow. Imagine how Paul would have felt. I mean, he's in prison, and this church that he loves sends a messenger with money to take care of him, and the messenger dies. How would, how would you feel in this situation? Like, and, and Paul is just so thankful that didn't happen. I remember when uh, Robbie Larimer got sick in Jamaica. Remember that? He was, he was on the plane. I mean, he, he got a mosquito bite. He got dang fever. fever. And that's, that's a serious illness. Oh, Rose was so frantic. She was just out. Of, I mean, there was nothing she could do. She's on this long five or six hour flight up to Seattle. And, and she knows there's nothing she can do for her boy. And that's, that's, how, that's how Paul felt. And he was so that God spared Epaphroditus. Paul could see that Epaphroditus was pouring his life into the work of the gospel, taking great risks, because this is the greatest work in the world. And he tells the Philippians, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. We need to appreciate and honor those who are sharing in the work of the gospel. And we need to have that same mindset, that same dedication that Timothy and Epaphroditus showed for the work of the gospel. We need to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do? What are we willing to sacrifice for the sake of, are we willing to suffer through for the sake of the gospel? What are we willing to, to take risk at and to go out and do in order to lead people to Christ? Jesus went to the cross for us. What are we willing to do for him? The work of the gospel is the greatest work. I'd like to have the praise team come and prepare to lead us in a closing song. And as they do that, think about how we can share in the greatest work of the world, the work of the gospel. It's more than just telling people about Jesus. Certainly it is that. It is inviting people to church. It is having people. But it's also living a life that demonstrates the gospel. It's that J-curve we talked about, that love J-curve, when, when we are willing to humble ourselves and consider others more important than ourselves, we're demonstrating the gospel. When we're willing to make sacrifices for the sake of others, we're willing to even suffer in order to serve one another. We are showing people the same kind of love Jesus showed to us when he went to the cross. It is the work of the gospel. Let's stand. We're going to have a word of prayer.
And after we pray, we'll sing one more song. But as we go out from here today, look for opportunities to engage in the work of the gospel. Let's pray. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the good news, this message of redemption, this message of, this message of salvation and forgiveness that we can only have through Christ. But God, we stand amazed, we stand in awe, we, we stand in great wonder when we think that you have invited us to partner with you in this great work. And we see this as a, a great privilege and also a great responsibility. God, us, empower us to carry out this great work. Help us to, to not only share our faith verbally through words, but help us to demonstrate the message of the gospel in the way that we live. And may you be glorified, honored, and praised. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus.